It's Adam here for PC Monitors and in this video I'm going to be taking a look at the Acer XB273K and as usual this video review is just part of a much longer and more detailed written review and you can find a link to that alongside information about how you can support the work that we do in the description of the video. You have to bear in mind that what you see on this video depends on my camera, it depends on YouTube, the processing done by my video software, and ultimately it depends on your own monitor. So what you see does not accurately represent how the monitor actually looks first hand. This model is part of the Acer Predator lineup of gaming monitors. It has a 27 inch IPS type panel, AHVA, Advanced Hyper Viewing Angle more specifically, and this has a 144Hz refresh rate and support for 3840 by 2160 4K UHD resolution. The screen surface is very light matte anti-glare. It's actually slightly lighter than the screen surfaces used on the more expensive models with their more complex backlighting solutions, such as the ASUS PG27UQ and the Acer X27. And this gives a good smooth look to the image, only a little bit of graininess, which most users won't really notice, won't find bothersome. It keeps things looking quite clear and, and vibrant. It's good for the clarity and vibrancy potential and it handles glare from the room quite well. The pixel density on this model is excellent due to the resolution and screen size. Some users will tell you that 32 inch is a good screen size for the 4k UHD resolution and I would agree with that in the sense that it gives you sort of the maximum screen area and you wouldn't have to resort to scaling necessarily or such high levels of scaling and it also gives you a look to the image which is quite similar to the 27 inch models in terms of the sort of detail you get and the clarity um, except it's nicer to have the larger screen obviously. That doesn't mean that 27 inch is in any way pointless for this resolution. In fact I find this resolution works very nicely on a screen of this size. It's big enough to appreciate the resolution and the pixel density is indeed excellent, so it gives a really nice level of clarity to suitably high resolution content such as games. In terms of the desktop experience, it also gives you a really good amount of desktop real estate, good amount of space to play with. I like to use 125% scaling, but users will have their own preferences. And there's an article on the website all about the 4K UHD experience on a screen of this kind of size. And you'll see more comparisons there with different scaling levels and what they might look like on the desktop. We'll give you a sort of rough indication of that. So back to that pixel density then. Gives you a nice amount of space, 125% scaling. I can actually use a screen of this size from say, uh, my normal viewing distance is about 70 centimeters or so, give or take 10 centimeters depending on my posture and that kind of thing. And I find this screen actually usable with no scaling, but I also find things just look too small and it's a bit odd to be honest. So I like to use it with 125% scaling and with that you get a really nice amount of desktop real estate and um, you get this test. The text looks really nice and crisp. It uh, certainly benefits from the high pixel density even when you're using scaling, providing the application scales properly. Unfortunately, many applications do and Windows 10 does handle scaling quite well. You can definitely make good use of the pixel density and it gives you great multitasking potential or if you just want to focus on a single document as you can see you can see absolutely loads of information at the same time so good for productivity purposes something to be aware of with this model i'm running at 120 hertz now and i say more about this in the written review but this is because if you set it to 144 hertz it uses what's called chroma subsampling so it doesn't use a normal full range RGB signal and it uses compression and that's because of the bandwidth required for 3840 by 2160 at 144 hertz it exceeds the capability with an uncompressed signal. On the desktop, you won't be able to see this in the video necessarily, there's some examples in the written review and I talk more about this, but basically on the desktop text, which is thin on the desktop, has a really fringed appearance and it's quite clear actually on the text here as well. It kind of has a red and green fringe. It's mainly the red you'll notice, but uh, either way, it's not a very nice thing <laughs> to actually have this on the desktop. So I like to keep it 120 hertz. However, the good news is when you're on a game or watching a movie, they're designed to look just fine on screens which use chroma subsampling because many TVs use that. 
and I didn't notice any issues at all when I was watching content on Netflix, YouTube, playing a variety of games, running the monitor at 144 hertz. I mean, having said that, I wouldn't generally use 144 hertz for Netflix because that's on the desktop anyway. But the point is, just don't worry about this um, when you're in a game or watching a movie. You can use whatever refresh rate you're comfortable with. I should also note that if you're running the monitor in HDR, there are slightly different signal issues which occur. Um, when I say issues, they're not really issues, um, but they're things to be aware of, and I'll cover them in the HDR section. I'm now going to look at the external features of the monitor. As you can see, it's a member of the Predator series. You can see a shiny Predator logo there, and the shape of the stand as well. It's sort of quite angular. That's a distinctive Predator-like design. And overall, it has a fairly sort of subdued look for a gaming monitor, really. It does have a little bit of red there, but other than that, it's matte black plastic and a powder coated metal with a sort of dark grey appearance there for the stand. It's quite a nice solid feeling stand design. The bezels themselves, moderately thick, matte black plastic. The bottom bezel actually has a little texture. It's difficult to see that on the camera but it has a sort of material-like texture. It is made of plastic and it's quite a subtle texture, so you don't really notice it in general, but it's a nice little touch anyway. You also see some little stickers there, which you can remove if you want to. I didn't do that because this is a review sample and I don't want to be left for the annoying residue or take these stickers off and not be able to put them back on again. So that one there, Delta E color accuracy, just to show that it is carefully calibrated out of the box. And there's NVIDIA G-Sync HDR logo there. Another thing to note from the front, um, at the top indeed, there's a little light sensor there. As explored in the OSD video, that allows the monitor to adjust its brightness based on the room lighting. At the bottom, there's a strip of LEDs, the ambient light feature of the monitor, or part of the ambient light feature of the monitor, and that's explored in the OSD video. The screen surface itself, it's very light matte anti-glare, so it offers decent glare handling. You can see, obviously, it's, it's a bright room here, and if you move around, you will see some, some glare and some sort of blunt reflections. But overall, normal use, I found the glare handling just fine. And this very light matte screen surface doesn't impede the clarity or the vibrancy as much as most matte screen surfaces. So I quite like the choice there. At the side, you can see it's pretty solidly built. The screen itself is reasonably thin at the thinnest point. It does lump out centrally and where the stand attaches obviously that goes a bit further back. And the stand design itself is reasonably deep so it's not great if you've got a very compact desk but it's not as deep as some stand designs either. It also offers a good amount of ergonomic flexibility so you can adjust the height of the screen and see the slider mechanism there. You can also tilt the screen backwards and forwards. Backwards quite a bit, forwards just a little bit. And as you can see, I'm accidentally doing, so it's difficult to do this with one hand. You can also swivel the screen left and right a bit. There are a couple of USB 3.0 ports as well at the left side. And you can see them there. Might not be clear in the video because it's difficult to capture the little very subtle icons there, but the top one actually supports fast charging. It's got a little battery icon there, and the bottom one's just a regular USB 3.0 port. You can also see there are little grooves here. There's actually something to screw the calibration hood into, and I'll show you that shortly. And you've got the same at the other side as well. The only difference really from the other side, the only clear difference is the fact that you don't have the USB 3.0 ports. At the rear, the Predator-inspired design continues. So you've got mainly matte black plastic, but there's various different textures actually. It's sort of a material-like texture at the bottom. The top has a sort of brush texture. Shiny Acer logo there, glossy black plastic. And there's a sort of bluish silver coloured ring there. And that's again, sort of matte black plastic or satin finish plastic. The stand attaches centrally and you can remove this little shroud there if you want. So you can use alternative mounting. You'd have to use a little knife like I'm using here, just a blunt knife and just sort of prise this off like this. Um, this is actually the first time I've done this, so hopefully I'm not breaking everything. So once you've clipped it off, and don't worry, you can put it back again afterwards. You'll see, first of all, there is a cooling fan there. 
Now, I didn't notice this at all when I was just using the monitor normally. I could never hear it above my system fan, even when my system was at idle. And if the monitor was under HDR or very bright, it didn't spool up more noticeably, really. So I found it just fine on my system. But I appreciate some users have silent systems and they try and eliminate all fans from their system. It can be annoying having the monitor having a fan. But uh, really, it was, at least on my unit, very quiet. And I don't think this is th something that most users should really worry about. But if you are mounting the monitor using an alternative mount, you can remove this bracket here and then replace it with an alternative VESA compatible mount. And it looks, um, and, and from user feedback as well, that it's a bit easier to mount. You don't have to worry so much about the airflow because you can restrict the airflow with the older model, the uh, more expensive X27, for example. It's quite easy to restrict the airflow if you're mounting it with an alternative VESA compatible solution. But in this case, it seems that the airflow's sort of thought out a bit better. It's actually got some vents at the top there, and it looks like it sort of already has an integrated standoff system. So, I mean, I haven't done it myself, and perhaps I'm wrong here, but it looks like it's a bit easier to mount without restricting the airflow. So there we go, I've clipped the little shroud back on. And as I said, it does go on very neatly again, no problem there. Towards the bottom left, you'll see that there are some OSD controls explored in the OSD video. There's a little joystick there, a little red joystick. The ports are down firing. They're concealed beneath this easily removable port cover here. The ports are actually going to be quite difficult to show you because of the fact that uh, it's not very easy to remove the stand and you can't put the monitor in portrait either, so I can't really angle the camera very well, but I'll do my best here. You can see first off there's a case lot, not technically a port, but that's just a little security lock, a Kensington lock slot there. There's HDMI 2, which is restricted to 60 hertz at the native resolution, but does offer HDR capabilities. There's DisplayPort 1.4, and that offers the full capabilities of the monitor, including G-Sync 144 hertz at the native 3840 by 2160 resolution. There is a DC power input. Sorry, it's very difficult to show you the power symbol and the actual port at the same time, but if the camera will focus and see there, there's the DC power input, which means there's an external power brick, and there's a 3.5 millimeter headphone jack. I'll just quickly show you the power brick. It's reasonably large. It is indeed quite a brick in its appearance. And there are some further USB 3 ports. So there are two USB 3 ports here. It doesn't have a symbol suggesting it supports fast charging, so I'm going to assume it doesn't. And there's the USB 3 upstream port there. A few final points to note at the rear. There's a cable tidy loop there, so you can feed your cables through rather than having them flailing underneath the monitor, so it's a little bit neater. At the top, the ventilation slats that I showed you before, they also house the ambient lighting feature, or part of the ambient lighting feature. So there were the LEDs at the bottom, but also some LEDs at the top. And they kind of give a gentle glow around the monitor or behind the monitor. It's really quite subtle because they're not the brightest LEDs, but they still give you a slight effect. There are also two 4 watt speakers integrated into this area, so they're up firing. They offer reasonable sound output. Not amazing sound output, but as far as integrated speakers go, they're not too bad really. I've now got the anti-glare hood, or the shading hood, or the calibration hood, whatever you want to call it, installed. It was very easy to attach. It just has some screws integrated into the hood itself, and you screw them into the holes I showed you earlier. You then just place the top bit on, and you don't need that on if you don't want it. You can just have the wings alone um, if you prefer the look like that, or you don't need the extra anti-glare properties at the top there. And there's also a little window if you've got a colorimeter to feed the colorimeter through there and feed the cables through, which certainly helps if you are calibrating the monitor. So if you've got the top detached, as you see, it comes off very easily. It just kind of sits in place. It's got some grooves there, which go onto the top of the wings. That's what the monitor looks like with just the wings attached. And you can angle them differently if you prefer. As I mentioned though, I don't have an issue with glare. Um, I mean, I have fairly tight handling of the lighting in my room when I need to, so I don't really need this hood um, on my unit. And I sort of find it looks a little bit weird with the hood on, to be honest. But 
it is there if you want to use it and it could help with reducing glare if you've got sort of bright light sources just sort of close to the monitor to the sides and above but it's not going to help if you've got very bright light striking the screen surface from behind you or anything like that. And just quickly, I've now got the monitor on, but my system isn't on, so I can just hear the fan of the monitor alone. I don't know if you can hear that in the video. It's just a kind of gentle whirring sound. You can also see the LEDs at the top. I've got them set to orange at the moment. So it really is quieter than my system fan, which is why when my system is on, I can't hear it at all. But you can still hear the fan sort of whirring away quietly. And the ambient light feature at the bottom, I might as well show you that. It's, uh, you can just see the LEDs quite distinctly in the video there. You can set up to various different colours, various different flashing patterns, all explored in the OSD video. I'm now on Shadow of the Tomb Raider, and I'm going to talk about the contrast performance of the monitor. A few things to be aware of. One of them is that I've positioned the camera so that it's looking down at the screen and that is to better simulate what you'll see looking at the monitor from an ergonomically correct viewing position so you will be having your eyes in line with the top third of the screen rather than the centre of the screen. The other thing to be aware of, and this is actually more important really, I actually use a Samsung Galaxy Note 9 to record the videos for my channel at the moment and in their infinite wisdom, Samsung have released a lovely update, which means that you have no manual control over the camera settings when you're recording a video, which is a complete pain in the backside when you're trying to show people how contrast looks on a monitor. As I say, though, regardless of this, what you see on the video is never really what you're going to see firsthand. But in this case, it really does exaggerate a few things. One thing that is exaggerated is IPS glow or AHVA glow, more correctly. You can see that towards the bottom corner of the screen. This scene here isn't actually dark enough to show this to the eye. You don't see this, um, maybe a bit, but it's exaggerated on the camera. But if this scene is darker, you certainly do see that. And you see it in both corners. In reality, you can see it a bit towards the bottom right as well. And as I say, for darker content, you do see this to the eye, but the camera's exaggerating it. And this IPS glow, it does affect the atmosphere of these dark scenes, but it's actually a bit lower on this model than I'd say is average for IPS type models of this size. It's not what I'd call a low glow screen. Um, it's certainly still a feature, this IPS glow, but it's just a bit reduced compared to some models. The static contrast is actually quite reasonable for the panel type. It's above 1000 to 1 that I measured even after the adjustments made to my test settings, so that's pretty reasonable. Another thing that the camera doesn't pick up properly, the light coming from there, it just looks like a giant bloom on the video, but in reality you can see distinct details there. So again, just be aware that what you're seeing in no way represents what you actually see. But it doesn't let me talk through a few things, which is certainly helpful. This monitor has a setting called variable backlight or SDR variable backlight. I've got that disabled at the moment. It doesn't actually do very much, and I explore this in more detail in the written review. It's a bit of an ugly feature to actually explore on a video where you can't adjust the camera settings manually. Um, but I will enable it for you anyway, and I'll just sort of go through what it does. I've had to actually adjust the monitor settings. So you see there, it says peak white nits, that's the brightness of the monitor, it's set to 50. That's actually much lower than I'd use normally but that's just because the camera completely exaggerates everything. And if you brighten this up, the setting I would use is 170. The camera makes things look absolutely ridiculous. So that's the setting I'd normally use. And what the camera shows here is all right because it's not particularly dark, but it does sort of overblow the uh, dark areas quite a bit. So I'm just uh, having to work with this, so bear with me. If you enable SDR variable backlight, which is in the picture menu, what it does is it splits the screen into a few dimming zones. Only a few though. It's actually, according to my testing, it splits it into three dimming zones. And what this does, and again, be aware that what you see on the video is unfortunately completely overblown. But what it does is it would allow the screen to dim the darker content, say there, more than it does for the brighter content over there. 
this isn't exactly the best scene to show you this, um, but to be honest, it's only three dimming zones. It doesn't actually make a massive amount of difference. And certainly the differences are too subtle to actually show you on a video. Really, it's just a feature that slightly enhances the contrast. It doesn't make a huge difference. You're talking maybe an extra 200 or, or 300 to one, and it's very situational. Most scenes, as, as with this scene here, it's a complex mixture of brighter and darker shades. It's mainly darker here, but there certainly are some brighter shades mixed in. And really, you don't have much of an advantage from having just three dimming zones. On the plus side, you don't have distinct halos like you do with the FALD solutions, the full array local dimming solutions with the 384 dimming zones. So you don't get distinct halos and largely the technology is quite seamless. You don't really notice it's doing much. It just sort of gives you a slight bonus in contrast overall. It doesn't really distract you. So because of that, most users will just want to keep it activated and just sort of set and forget, really. It gives you a little bonus. It's sort of nice to have. One downside is if you've got the monitor set to a low luminance, you like to use it nice and dim. Say you're one of those people who sets it to 100 candles per meter squared, or 100 nits, as they call it on this, um, or below, you'll find that the variable backlighting will generally boost things a little bit above that. Whereas if you're like me and you set it to say 170, so it's sort of, you know, between 100 and 200, what you'll find is the, the differences you see in the luminance with this setting on versus off are, are fairly gentle overall. So it's really more like an enhanced dynamic contrast mode, which uses multiple but not many dimming zones. So it's not something which most users will find distracting. It's just a little bonus. The other aspect of contrast or at least something which I lump into contrast, it obviously affects the image more broadly, is the screen surface, and I've already mentioned that's very light matte anti-glare. So the brighter elements here look fairly smooth. They've only got a very light misty graininess. They don't have a sort of coarse graininess or anything thick or distracting there. Um, so it gives a good kind of pop to these brighter elements. They stand out quite nicely. And obviously the, the contrast here, you know, you're not talking about levels which are anything compared to a good VA model and you're really talking about an experience which is sort of as good as you're going to see on an IPS model without a really complex backlighting solution. So really things don't look deep and atmospheric, especially if you're in a dim room as I am now, you're not going to really have things looking amazing and cinematic and atmospheric, but certainly you can expect at least a decent performance in that respect as far as the panel type goes. I'm going to run the Legom test for viewing angles, talking about colour reproduction, because I like to start off with this. It's a very good way of showing weaknesses and colour consistency. But to start off, I'd just like to mention that if you are looking at Legom and you're looking at your own monitor, if you're using scaling, the Legom text test gets completely messed up. So I was using 125% before, and it won't show the correct characteristics with the text. It'll just look completely red with the striping. Um, this will all make sense very shortly. So you see there, red striping, that's not correct. Um, and that's because it's been scaled up by the browser. If, however, you're not using any scaling, and you'll be able to see how small the desktop icons become, and you can see everything's very small. And that's why I like to use a bit of scaling ordinarily with a screen of this size and resolution. So the text now has a grey striping to it. And one thing I can notice, the monitor is actually emitting a slight buzzing noise now. It's quite subtle. Um, I don't know if it'll come out on the video, but that's just because of this particular pattern. It's sort of causing some issues with the monitor. I didn't notice this in anything else I was doing with the monitor, just on this specific test. So I really wouldn't worry about this. It's not a cause for concern. And I do wonder if I mute the speakers, whether it'll go away as well. No, it's still there. Anyway, moving on to the colour reproduction. Because of the IPS type panel, the AHVA panel, it has good colour consistency. The text here looks largely a blended grey with a slight sort of red tint, but it's pretty consistent throughout. Towards the edges, it's a little more blended, but it doesn't have the kind of distinct shifts between red, orange and green that you get on models with stronger viewing angle dependency to their gamma curve. 
and if you move your head around a bit or I move the camera around a bit it doesn't show obvious shifts either which other technologies would show. So the purple block here just looks a bluish purple throughout. It doesn't have any obvious extra pink hue in some regions of the screen versus others. It's pretty consistent and it doesn't sort of have a pink hue which shifts too much as you move your head. If you get to extremes then yes there are shifts because even IPS type panels like this do have some weaknesses in viewing angle but from a normal viewing position things are nice and consistent. Same with the red block. It looks a nice solid rich red, a very vibrant red actually uh, to my eye but that won't be captured on the camera properly. But there isn't a sort of more burnt appearance towards the bottom and sides as you get with a VA model or an extreme sort of gradient of really deep to really faded and pink towards the bottom that you get on a TN model. The green, nice solid green throughout. Um, because of the colour gamut it actually doesn't look too yellow either. It's a, a nice chartreuse green colour and it doesn't have the sort of yellowing that you'd get from a model with a weaker colour gamut so that's nice as well. The blue there, good solid blue but that's always the case. You can see some variation in brightness on some models, even IPS type models, um, just because of the uniformity issues so that can affect the brightness in different sections of the screen but uh, that isn't an issue on, on my unit here. I'm now on Battlefield 5 and I'm going to talk about colour reproduction using an in-game example. I like this scene here it's a really nice scene, especially on monitors which show nice vibrant colour output like this one does. And the reason for that is that this monitor has good extension beyond sRGB for the colour gamut. So you see some really nice vibrant elements. The, the fire there, for example, the reds and oranges and yellows of the fire really stand out nicely. But there's a lovely variety as well. And that's because unlike what you get when you digitally enhance saturation, so you use NVIDIA Digital Vibrance, what that would do is pull shades close to the edge of the colour gamut without expanding the gamut itself. So you're essentially compressing things and you lose the variety of shades. With this, you've got extension beyond sRGB. So you're looking at regular content like this. The monitor's under SDR at the moment. And this kind of content, games in general, they're designed with the sRGB colour space in mind. So when you've got a wider colour gamut like this, which actually colours 90% of DCI P3, I think that's approximately 125% sRGB. I might have just made that up, but um, it certainly extends a fair bit beyond sRGB. And what that means is colours are more saturated than they should be, but it's an even saturation and your shade variety is maintained. So you get a really nice natural variety of shades. And the extra saturation isn't extreme. It's not as high as on the ASUS PG27UQ or the Acer X27 because they offer 98% DCI P3 coverage. So this monitor doesn't have that sort of level of oversaturation, but it certainly does lift shades up. It just gives a bit of extra vibrancy and most users will actually like this look. This monitor also has an effective sRGB emulation mode if you prefer. Um, to sort of tone things down and have things more accurately represented. So it caters to that as well. But I like the sort of look it gives. So there's some really nice sort of standout vibrant shades. And the environment in general looks rich. It looks quite natural though. It doesn't look cartoonish or anything like that. And that's something that I find with monitors which cover the traditional wide gamut, such as Adobe RGB. If you've got close Adobe RGB tracking, what you'll find is that there's a lot of extension in the green region of the gamut, but the red and blue region of the gamut, that just corresponds to sRGB. And what that does is it skews shades, it makes things look completely wrong. Whereas on this monitor, the extra saturation is very even, so you get that sort of variety maintained and things look quite natural overall. I would say that the, the wood of the rifle there, for example, it's a slightly reddish toned wood naturally, um, but it does look a bit more red than it ideally would. And the logs there as well, they have a sort of slightly rich red hue, which they shouldn't really have. And there's some other elements on this game and other games I've tried where they'll have sort of rich red earth. And again, the red hue is a bit strong. And the greens, sometimes the greens are too lush. And these greens there, for example, they're sort of slightly too bright, slightly too yellowish. But really, you know, the overall look is nice and most users aren't really going to notice these little nitpicky things and they're actually just going to enjoy the vibrant look overall. And the colour consistency as well, as I've shown you with Legom, 
very good indeed on this model. So you don't get the kind of shifts in saturation and gamma the vibrant look has maintained throughout the screen very nicely. I'm now running the monitor in HDR. It will look quite different on the video, um, but again, you can't actually see the exact nature of these differences. And all I've done is turned on HDR. I haven't changed any other graphic settings. It was on Ultra for most things, and it still is. But it really does bring a new lease of life to the game. It looks very different indeed, um, in a very nice way, in my opinion. However, it's not a perfect HDR experience. I'm, I'm going to just say that right off the bat. It is VESA Display HDR 400. I've already mentioned with the variable backlight feature, it only has three dimming zones. So contrast, which I'm actually going to come on to by using Tomb Raider as an example, because I think that's a better example for that aspect of HDR. So it doesn't really tick the boxes there. But in terms of the colour gamut, as I've mentioned, 90% DCI-P3. So that actually exceeds the requirements for VESA Display HDR 400 for that certification level. And the colour gamut is put to really good use for HDR content like this. So the, the fire there, for example, before, I mean, I said it looked very vibrant, and it still does. It actually has, you know, really nice vibrancy. But the sort of golden yellow hues are brought out better. Before, um, under SDR, they looked a bit more saturated and orange than they should. And some of the oranges sort of verged on red when they shouldn't. I'd also already mentioned that the rifles there, the wood on the rifles, looked a bit too red. They look more neutral now, more as they should. Same with the wood there. And some of the green tones I'd mentioned looked a bit brighter before, they're toned down. And again, you're not going to be able to see the nature of these differences necessarily on the video. It's sort of difficult to pick up, but um, certainly I can notice it to my eye. But things don't look washed out at all. If you've just had the monitor under SDR and then you switch it first to HDR, you might kind of notice this toned down saturation and think things are looking washed out. But really, things are actually just more accurately represented. And the game developers, it depends on the game title. Some game developers will have sort of really vibrant look to HDR and they can choose to do that if they want. This game sort of has a gritty aesthetic and it really is sort of more toned down in HDR as that's the aesthetic they're going for. But as I'd mentioned, there are plenty of vibrant elements. These really nice autumnal colours here, the, the fire there really has excellent vibrancy. And thinking of other games, you might have games where you've got sort of spell effects and stuff like that, and they often, under HDR, will look really vibrant and rich. So don't think that things are looking washed out under HDR. They're just looking more accurately represented. Another aspect of HDR is 10-bit colour reproduction. This monitor supports that, and the pipeline in general, the HDR10 pipeline, does support that. Now, I have mentioned something about the colour signal before. This changes under HDR. I'm actually running the game at 144 hertz at the moment. Um, I wouldn't ordinarily use 144 hertz for HDR, and I'll come on to why shortly. And it's not what you might think. It's not nothing to do with the colour signal itself. So if you go into the menu as I am here, first of all, you'll notice that quite a lot of things are greyed out. You can't set many things under HDR. Reference white nits, um, that's blocked off, so you can't manually control the brightness. That's all done automatically. Contrast also greyed out, and um, various other things greyed out. The SDR variable backlights, that is automatically enabled under HDR. Obviously, it's not the SDR variable backlight, but the local dimming feature is enabled, and you can't disable it under HDR. Backlight response, I didn't mention that before, but this just changes the speed of response for the variable backlight. And gaming is the fastest. Desktop's the slowest, hybrid somewhere between. Just leave it on gaming. I see no reason to use any slower setting. It works just fine with gaming. No drawbacks to that. The colour as well. You can actually adjust the colour channels under HDR. And that's to kind of offset slight changes to the white point because you can calibrate HDR and SDR in much the same way in that respect. So you can sort of adjust that. And I'm using my test settings here. No problem there. If you go on the information section, this is where it gets sort of interesting. You'll see range limited and it says format 10 bits per channel and it says YCBCR422BT2020. So what that complete mouthful means, it's not using your usual full range RGB signal. However, the end result is exactly the same. So if you're running the monitor at 98 hertz, I'll just, I'll just do that now. 98 hertz or below, 
this is how you get the full RGB 10-bit signal. So if I go back into the information section there, you'll see it says range full and format is 10 bits per channel RGB 444 BT 2020. But the output itself looks exactly the same. And I'm not just saying that now, I've checked this using a range of game examples um, and HDR movie content as well. And it doesn't make any difference to the output as far as I'm concerned. And I have a sensitive eye for this kind of thing. I've looked at sort of gradients and fine manipulations of shades and all sorts of little nuances. Um, and it just doesn't make a difference to my eye at all. If you set it to 120 hertz, things are different once again. This is actually my preferred setting for HDR. I'll come on to why very shortly, but if you're running 120 hertz, some people can have a heart attack because it now says 8 bits per channel, RGB 444B2 2020. So it's a full range RGB signal, but it's only 8 bits per channel. That's only on the monitor side though. All it means is it's offloaded the dithering stage to the GPU and the GPU is handling the two bits of dithering rather than the monitor. The end result for the image, again, it frankly makes no difference. So don't worry about it. Um, on paper, it might look like it's making a big difference, but it's still using a 10 bit pipeline. And again, I've looked at these sort of fine gradients, weather effects, fog, that kind of thing, and they're handled really just fine, 120 Hertz. Now, the reason I don't use 144 Hertz is simply that there's a slight decrease in performance, around 10%. It'll depend on the exact scene in the game, the game itself, your GPU. But on my GTX 1080 Ti, it gave me a slight performance penalty. And this occurred regardless of whether G-Sync was active or not. So I like to use 120 Hertz just to avoid that performance penalty. And let's be honest, it's difficult to get above 120 frames a second or even 120 frames a second. Um, especially when you're running HDR and you've probably got some of the graphics settings turned up a bit. So it doesn't really make a difference whether you're using 144, 120 um, in terms of the edge of responsiveness you'd get with the higher value. Um, but you will notice the decrease in performance. So that's why I use 120. So the 10-bit 10, the 10 colour processing, it works just fine. Again, this isn't going to come across on the video, but there are sort of nuances of subtle shade variety, which is completely lacking in SDR. This is easiest to notice when you're looking at shadow detail, and I'm going to talk about this on Tomb Raider, using Shadow of the Tomb Raider as an example. But the undercarriage here, the sort of subtle varieties of shades, the shadow detailing, if you prefer, is just much better. So you can see this detail, um, but again, you probably can't see this in the video, but I can see detail um, around the tyre and in the shaded areas below that. It just looks far more realistic. Also, the handling of the brighter shades, weather effect, fog, that kind of thing. There's a sort of really fine gradient. The light there, the way it sort of blooms the gradient there, um, the sort of misty effect, the haze, whatever you want to call it. It's really very smooth and handled much more pleasantly than it is under SDR. So that's all part of the 10 bit color reproduction and just HDR in general, allowing more careful tone mapping. I'm now running Shadow of the Tomb Raider. I've got the game running in HDR. And again, the sort of overall look is, is very different in a positive way in my view. And you can see the scene I'm about to show you is one which can actually look really spectacular under HDR. It's probably one of my favorite scenes under HDR um, in any sort of game I've played anyway. And the reason for that is with a proper HDR screen, and, and by that I mean one which has a very, really, really high peak luminance and really effective local dimming. Um, I'm not gonna pretend that any monitor has a perfect HDR performance, but some are certainly better than others. Now this model, as I said, it's display HDR 400. So the peak luminance is actually a bit above 400 candles per meter squared. I think I measured around 450. But what that means is bright elements like the glint from the sun there on the water and the sort of light streaming in up there. It doesn't really have that kind of 
arresting pop that you get with some HDR monitors where that will just stand out really beautifully. You just don't get that effect at all. And you do get that effect, for example, on the ASUS PG27UQ and the Acer X27. So you don't get that, but as I'd mentioned, the sort of the nuances of shade, the subtle variety of shades, that's very much there. Um, and the more careful mapping of the colours is very much there. So Laura's skin actually looks really as it should. She doesn't look sort of overly tanned as she does under SDR. And the variety of subtly different green shades there and the, the browns as well looks really nice. And I think what really completes it for me is the, the shadow detailing, the sort of really dark areas where there are shadows in the vegetation. It just looks so much more realistic and um, the sort of really really subtle variety when you when you just look at it sort of as a whole you don't really notice that but it just looks more realistic um, and i think it complements the high pixel density very nice and has a really nice look same over here and actually the, the light cast on those leaves there has a really natural look to it which is completely lacking under sdr and again the 10-bit color reproduction you get the sort of rays of light there with a really smooth gradient and this does not come across on the video I'm afraid you can just see a big ball of light but the different levels of light there are really nice ideally though the local dimming would be something which has far more zones I mean in an ideal world it would be per pixel of course and what that would mean is the really bright elements like the glare there and the sort of the center of that light there would be really bright um, and there'd be sort of careful control of the illumination and not just the mapping of the tones themselves. So you don't get the, the complete package here, that's what I'm saying. But that's not to say that there aren't some nice advantages to HDR. And the local dimming on the backlight, as I've said, it's really three, it's three zones. It doesn't really do an awful lot. But for bright scenes like this, it does look bright overall, but darker areas, especially when they're sort of towards the corners of the screen. They're dimmer than they would be if the backlight was just controlled as one unit. So you do get some advantage from the local dimming solution still. I'm now on a scene which is predominantly dark. It does have some brighter elements mixed in, but it really has a lot of very dark shades. Now, again, bear in mind that the camera is exaggerating the effect here. It makes things look brighter than they should and brighter than they do to the eye. But even so, ideally, the really dark shades would look much deeper than they do. Um, having said that, it, this, this scene is extremely unforgiving. And you actually find that um, many monitors with HDR really just don't get these dark shades looking right. And that's because it can't just shut off the backlight. Unless it's got a massive number of dimming zones, you're not going to be able to have the really dark area there and the brighter shades there. You can't just shut the backlight off completely because then the brighter shades would just be pretty much invisible. So you can absolutely see again IPS glow and there are some shifts as I shift the camera, some shifts as the dimming zones sort of change what they're doing. But there isn't a kind of halo effect or anything like that because it doesn't have that number of dimming zones. And actually on some VESA Display HDR 400 and 600 level displays, and even HDR 1000 level displays, depending on the settings you're using, they can actually flood these kind of scenes as well and sort of mess up the dark areas. Feel free to look at my other um, reviews for reference. For example, the Philips 328P6VUBREB. I think I've got that model right. It doesn't really roll off the tongue. That was a VESA Display HDR 600 compatible display but that really messed the scene up. The AOC Aegon AG273QCX, I consider that to have probably the best VESA Display HDR400 implementation, or to be honest, this, this uh, monitor and that one, probably the best uh, VESA Display HDR400 implementations that you'll find. And even that messed up this, and it has stronger native contrast than this model as well messed up this scene and also actually flickered a lot. The backlight couldn't decide what it was doing, dimming and uh, brightening up. That didn't have any local dimming, so um, I suppose that was a slight weakness on that model compared to this one. But you do sort of not notice flickering necessarily, but there are some sort of shifts in the backlight, the dimming zones, 
as, as you move the camera around. So, I mean, I don't really want to sort of bang on about this too much more. Um, but all I'm saying is, as far as the HDR experience goes on this monitor, it does the tone mapping very nicely. It displays daylight scenes quite nicely as well. It doesn't have a particularly high peak luminance and it doesn't have an effective local dimming solution which can really bring about excellent dark shades and bright shades together at the same time. So it is far from a full fat HDR experience, but it's also far from a useless HDR experience. I'm now on Battlefield 5 again, and I'm gonna talk about the responsiveness of the monitor. This monitor offers 144 Hz refresh rate, and you can see in the top right corner my frame rate of the game, it's about 144 frames a second, a little bit of fluctuation, but pretty much using the most out of the monitor in terms of responsiveness because of this high frame rate. This 144 hertz and 144 frames a second experience, it means that your monitor is outputting up to 2.4 times as much information every second as a 60 hertz monitor. And one thing this does is it gives a much nicer connected feel, or what I call connected feel. This sort of describes the precision and the fluidity as you're interacting with the game world. It's separate from input lag. It's something which you won't get on a 60 hertz monitor, even if the input lag's very low. So the connected feel is really good, very much enhanced by this. Input lag does also affect the connected feel. And on this model, it's quite low. I measured under five milliseconds. So most users won't have an issue at all with that aspect of this monitor. The other thing to consider when it comes to the 144Hz refresh rate is that it greatly decreases perceived blur. Perceived blur is a concept which is very important to understand when it comes to monitor responsiveness. There's an article on the website all about monitor responsiveness which covers this in some detail and the written review also summarises this. But essentially there are two main components to perceived blur that you see on a monitor. One of them is caused by eye movement and closely linked to the refresh rate and the frame rate you're running at. So 144 hertz, 144 frames a second. This greatly reduces the eye movement compared to 60 hertz or running 60 frames a second. And that greatly reduces the perceived blur due to eye movement. So that gives a nice competitive edge. The other aspect of perceived blur is down to the pixel responses. So weaknesses in pixel responsiveness can also contribute to perceived blur. On VA models in particular, that can be quite a significant contributor. On this monitor, I'm pleased to say that the pixel responsiveness is very good overall. In fact, many of the pixel transitions make optimal use of the 144Hz refresh rate or come very close to that. So you don't really have a sort of big competitive disadvantage when you compare even to a fast TN model. There are some slight weaknesses and I like to use this particular scene on Battlefield Five because there are quite a lot of different pixel transitions involving darker shades. And that's where monitors tend to struggle if they do struggle. These kind of weaknesses are really obvious on VA models or a typical VA model. Even actually the faster VA models have some distinct weaknesses here. On this model, there's nothing distinct. There's some slight weaknesses. So for example, here, there's just a little bit of powdery trailing behind the wood there with the sky in the background. So the very dark shade of the wood with the sort of medium shade in the background, but it really doesn't catch the eye. If I go in here, there are some great transitions which pretty much every monitor struggles with, where it says to pick up a letter E, so that has a very bright shade, essentially white, against a much darker background, and there's a little bit of this powdery training again, but it's, it's fairly faint and it doesn't really catch the eye. It's not smeary at all in its appearance. And these are just specific examples of these weaknesses. Most pixel transitions don't show any weakness at all of this type. There's also a little bit of overshoot on this monitor. It's not eye-catching and it's not extreme at all. In fact, most users won't be able to see it and it's not really going to come out on the camera um, or the video, I can imagine, because it's not really particularly obvious. But I can see a slight sort of bright, slightly bluish trail behind the flag post there and the tree there. So. It's just a bit brighter than the foreground or background colour. kind of stands out if you're looking for that specific trailing, but it doesn't really catch your eye in general use, so it's not something which most users are going to be at all bothered by. There's also a little bit of shadowy overshoot, so that's where there's a sort of trail behind objects which is darker than the background or the object colour. 
There's a little bit of that around the lamp there. I know some other sort of examples here probably in the scene, but it's really very subtle, this kind of overshoot. There's some better examples in the written review if you look at the test UFO shots. Um, so this overshoot really stays very close to the object itself. It doesn't extend much further out and it's actually quite blended in its appearance. So it really doesn't bother people in general. Um, so, I mean, yeah, overall really a solid 144 hertz performance at these high refresh rates. The monitor also offers support for NVIDIA G-Sync and that comes into play where your frame rate drops. Now, being a 3840 by 2160 4K UHD model, it's obviously very demanding running a lot of titles, especially if you turn the graphics settings up a bit. Something I mentioned in the written review a bit more, um, the competitive edge that I feel gaming at this pixel density, when combined with the excellent responsiveness of the monitor, that's something I really appreciate. The sort of clarity when you're moving, because of the lower perceived blur, it does give a nice edge and it maintains the sort of crisp look much better than the 60 hertz monitors do. So that's your typical UHD monitor. And this gives a nice competitive edge because you can see enemies more distinctly against backgrounds. They're much easier to track. And I actually find from a competitive point of view, this monitor is really quite enjoyable to use. And the resolution itself, even if you're using low settings, you do get this crispness, which I'm talking about, um, the sort of the definition to objects. So that's actually really nice. And that's something you can appreciate even if you are using fairly low graphic settings or your game is not particularly graphically amazing. As I mentioned earlier, the monitor supports NVIDIA G-Sync. What I've done is I've turned the graphics up a bit. So the frame rate has dropped. It's around 100 frames a second, a little bit either side of that. So what this means is Yes, the connected feel, the perceived blur, it's affected because of the reduced frame rate compared to 144 frames a second or much higher frame rates than this. But really the connected feel is still really nice here, especially compared to 60 frames a second. And the perceived blur levels are quite decent as well. A real advantage of G-Sync though is that it gets rid of tearing and stuttering. So if I didn't have G-Sync active, I'd notice obvious tearing if I had V-Sync disabled or I'd notice obvious stuttering if I had V-Sync enabled. And as a user who's sensitive to both things, it's really very nice not having these issues uh, to contend with from frame rate and refresh rate mismatches. Sensitivity to that does vary and sensitivity to frame rate in general varies. Most users I do find certainly enjoy having G-Sync, especially at a resolution like this, where it's really very demanding and it's difficult to run consistently high frame rates. And on a different scene on Battlefield 5, just for a little bit of a change of scenery, I've also increased the graphics settings further. So I'm at around 60 frames a second. So with this, basically you don't benefit from the 144 hertz refresh rate in the way that you do at the higher frame rates. But G-Sync still does its thing. It still gets rid of tearing and stuttering. So that gives very good flexibility in terms of your frame rate range. But G-Sync, of course, goes below this as well. Just, I'd like to just talk about something because this is the kind of frame rate range. It's clearly in the double digits, well below 100 frames a second. With free sync models, you tend to find that there's obvious overshoot introduced at these kind of reduced frame rates and refresh rates. With G-Sync models like this, though, they use variable overdrive and the pixel overdrive is retuned for these for a broad range of different refresh rates. And it means that you don't get this obnoxious overshoot. And actually things are very nicely tuned for a really wide variety of frame rates and refresh rates. On this model, as usual for G-Sync Monitor, it does actually go down to 30 Hertz. And even down there, there's no sort of obvious overshoot that's suddenly introduced just because the refresh rate is reduced. Now I'm just gonna increase my graphic settings again so I can sort of just show you that. I've set the resolution scale to 200%, which at this resolution is very demanding, even on my NVIDIA GTX 1080 Ti. I've got things pretty much on ultra aside from that. So you can see that the frame rate, top right again, is really low now. Interestingly, the, the frame rate that I'm showing you there is actually from the OSD, and that displays the refresh rate that the display is running at for the most part. But it also is quite clever because you see it's showing 22. The monitor isn't actually running at 22 or 23 hertz, but 
it is running at that frame rate, uh, the game is. So it knows that the monitor itself is actually doubling the frame rate or sticking to a multiple. So where it's 21 frames a second here, the monitor is actually at 42 hertz because it can't actually go below 30 hertz, even with G-Sync. Gives it a really wide effective range of operation and there's no specific issue under 30 frames a second in terms of tearing or stuttering. That's kept at bay by the refresh rate sticking to a multiple of the frame rate. But really the experience is extremely juddery. It's extremely just, you lose the connected feel completely. Perceived blur is mad. That's got nothing to do with the monitor though. That's purely the low frame rate because G-Sync doesn't do anything about the low frame rate itself. Yes, it's still nicer than the alternative and that's having additional tearing and stuttering from frame rate and refresh rate mismatches. But this really isn't where you want to be in a high refresh rate monitor or any monitor for that matter. I've decreased the graphics settings because that was really doing my head in those low frame rates. I can't stand them. So I'm closer to my nice 100 frames a second here. And I've still got the textures on ultra and there's still great advantage from the resolution itself as well. Um, so, you know, just be aware that it is a demanding resolution, but you can certainly make some compromises with graphic settings and still have things looking nice because of the pixel density itself being really strong. And the overall responsiveness, really just to finish off, really very impressive. The pixel responsiveness is very good. Really, it's as good as I've seen from a non-TN model. It's actually slightly better than the ASUS PG27UQ I reviewed, which was actually very strong in that area as well. Not any huge differences, just that the overshoot is slightly lower in general on this model. So they've tuned things very nicely indeed. So really, it goes a very solid 144 Hz experience and a very solid experience as your frame rate dips as well with G-Sync Active. To wrap up then, as a member of Acer's Predator lineup, it's a gaming monitor. It makes no apologies for that. The styling, it's not as bright and obviously gamer-esque as some Predator models in the past and just gaming monitors in general. I actually quite like the design overall. I like the sort of solid feel to the stand base, nice metal there, I like to see a bit of metal. And there are no obvious flashy elements in terms of colours, quite subdued little red elements here and there, and a tiny silver Predator logo, but nothing really eye-catching or obnoxious. Overall, a fairly subdued design really. Lots of matte black plastic as well. The ergonomic flexibility is very good as well. The overall build quality is very solid as well. Not that you really spend too long sort of fiddling with the monitor and touching it so much, you generally look at it more, but it is still nice to have a nice solid build quality, especially because it's not the cheapest monitor on the market. The image performance as well, really it ticks a lot of boxes there. The contrast, it's large as you'd expect from the panel type. It offers static contrast slightly ahead of the 1000 to 1 specified. Even after the adjustments made to my test settings, this was the case. It also has a variable backlight mode, which splits the backlight into multiple dimming zones. And that gives you a bit of an edge in contrast. It's quite situational. It doesn't have many dimming zones, so it doesn't really make a huge difference, but it just gives you a little bit of an edge. And it isn't really a feature which I find distracting in its implementation. So most users will just want to leave that on. The screen surface, very light matte anti-glare. I like that kind of screen surface. It gives a nice clear look to the image and it preserves the clarity and vibrancy much better than other matte screen surfaces with this sort of stronger finish. There's just a little bit of graininess and in a brighter room lighting like this, you don't really notice that at all. It uh, has actually quite a smooth appearance. I mean, it could technically be smoother, I guess, but um, as far as matte surfaces go, this is one of the better ones you'll find. The resolution as well, really nice pixel density. A lot of useful workspace, even if you use a bit of scaling or a bit of application specific zoom. And the look that that gives to games is really very nice, I find. Yes, you could argue that 32 inches is a better size for this resolution, in the sense that you get much of the same benefit from the sort of clarity and detail, but you also enjoy a larger screen. But that is not to say that 27 inches is somehow a complete waste at this resolution. It's not the case at all. There's a lot of benefit to be had even there. Onto the colour reproduction then. This monitor's colour gamut isn't as wide as the ASUS PG27UQ or the Acer X27, 
but it does extend comfortably beyond sRGB. It gives a vibrant look to the image, a vibrant but varied look to the image, I should say. So it maintains really good variety of shades and things look vibrant overall, which many users will like. But they don't look cartoonish or outlandish in their vibrancy and really it's quite a nice look in my opinion. It also offers an effective sRGB emulation setting if you prefer to tone things down for whatever reason. The panel type as well invites strong colour consistency so you don't have losses of saturation towards the edges or bottom of the screen as you do with VA and more of a TN models so that was certainly nice to have as well and coupled with the colour gamut really you get a very rich and consistent colours you get throughout the screen very nice indeed. The monitor also supports HDR, and that is to say that it will respond to HDR10 content, that's the pipeline it uses. Specifically, it supports VESA Display HDR400, so that's the lowest level of HDR certification that VESA will actually certify for. So it's not amazing, it doesn't have an effective local dimming solution in the sense that it doesn't have loads of backlight zones. As I mentioned earlier, with the variable backlight, it does have some local dimming capabilities, but it doesn't really dramatically change the experience or deliver a true HDR-like experience in terms of contrast. It does give a slight edge over not having that kind of thing, so just having global dimming, the backlight acting as one unit. The peak brightness, it goes up to a bit below 500 candles per meter squared, so it's not exceptionally bright, and so you don't get those really amazing bright elements standing out beautifully well as you get with some HDR models, including the ASUS PG27UQ and Acer X27. However, as far as VESA Display HDR400 products go, this is one of the best implementations I've seen. And that's partly because the colour gamut at about 90% DCI-P3 is largely appropriate for that kind of content. It's really what they're sort of targeting there. The monitor also puts it to good use. It maps things accurately. It does support 10-bit colour reproduction. Of course, there are some issues depending on the refresh rate you're running at, but those issues are really just issues on paper. The pipeline does maintain 10-bit capability, but sometimes it's the GPU that handles the dithering rather than the monitor. The end result, though, really very nice. The variety of subtle shades is enhanced, and you particularly notice that when you're looking at shadow detailing. That is much better in HDR than in SDR. So in that respect, this monitor certainly does deliver quite a nice HDR experience. But just be aware that, as I've said, the contrast performance for HDR is not stellar. In terms of responsiveness, this monitor delivered a solid performance as well. Not really very much to complain about, to be honest. Slight weaknesses, which most users, to be fair, won't even notice even when they're looking out for them. And it really delivers a solid 144Hz performance. G-Sync did its thing as well. Got rid of tearing and stuttering from refresh rate and frame rate mismatches. Very polished experience regardless of the frame rate. So that worked really very nicely. And the combination of the high resolution and pixel density and the high refresh rate, that suitably high frame rate, really did give this sort of clarity during motion, which I found gave a really nice competitive edge when I was playing games like Battlefield 5. It's quite subjective, really. Not everyone will find this so amazing. But to me, it really does deliver a nice competitive gaming experience, which some people might be quite surprised by, because that's not really what you'd associate high resolution monitors with generally. But there are certainly benefits to be had. So really the last thing to say, I really enjoyed using the monitor. I do have to give it back to Acer because it's a review sample. I would quite happily keep this as my main gaming monitor otherwise. And in terms of the, the pricing, it is an expensive product, but I do feel you still get a lot of value for money from it. Of course, when it comes to pricing, you do have to compare it to the Acer X27 and the ASUS PG27UQ. They are significantly more expensive. This is a lot cheaper than those models. You don't get the 384 dimming zones on the backlight, and you don't get the same level of HDR performance. But you do get a colour gamut which is quite wide and gives vibrant colours, not as wide. It doesn't have a quantum dot solution. But the overall colour reproduction is really very good, as I've mentioned. Responsiveness is excellent as well, and the combination of the responsiveness and the high pixel density is really what makes this monitor quite a special experience. So that's really all there is to the Acer XB273K. Be sure to check out the full review on PCMonitors.info. There's a link to that in the description of the video, alongside information about how you can support the work that we do.